We're going to look at verse 12. We'll begin reading in verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'll use it to mold us, to sharpen us, to change us into the image of Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Two young girls were talking, uh, as young girls do, and, and uh, one of them said to the other one, I have ten dimes. And the other girl looked at her hand, and she said, I only see five dimes. And um, the other girl, the first girl, responded, well, I have five dimes, but my, mo- my father told me that when he gets home from work tonight, he's going to give me five more dimes, so I have ten dimes. She understood something about her father. Not, a, not everybody has a father like this, but she did. She understood that her father's promise was as good as done, and she believed in her father's faithfulness. Well, I want you to notice in verse 13 some, a similar theme. One of the most important truths in the Bible, and that is the phrase, God is faithful. Um, I don't know if there is anything much more important for Christians to believe than to believe in God's faithfulness. That is, to believe that God's promises are as good as done. God deserves our undying wonder and praise, but more than that, God deserves our, absolutely, our absolute trust in the fact that he is faithful. It's not enough to assent to the fact. It is not enough to just nod along and say, hey, we believe that God is faithful, but we must live according to that belief. We must let that play out in our lives. In fact, if we say that we believe God is faithful but do not act accordingly, how much do we really believe it? If we say in words but do not prove it in deeds, are we not frauds? And do we not believe that God is not always faithful to us in that situation? Now, let's, uh, let's at least say it in words this morning. So say this with, is God faithful? All right, you, uh, you, you get the idea, right? God is faithful. We're willing to say it in words. Um, does God deserve our absolute trust in his faithfulness? Yes, he does. Yes. So for the rest of this message, I want to encourage you to live what you just said um, and to prove it in deeds, to believe God's faithfulness through your life, through your actions, through your attitudes, through your heart's belief. Um, and, and see, we act in real time, in real circumstances, not just in abstract ideas. And so when is it that we have the best opportunity? And when do we have the greatest need to trust in God's faithfulness, to believe he is faithful? When do we need to trust his faithfulness most? Well, usually it is in a time of temptation, right? When temptation strikes us, when the circumstances of life, the fallen nature of our flesh, and the constant pressures of this world tell us to sin, at this time, the time of temptation, that's when we need to trust God's faithfulness, not just in word, but in action. A moment ago, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and members of the church at Corinth 2,000 years ago these people were subjected to some pressures and temptations in life that we're not extremely familiar with, but were real in their lives. See, they were tempted to go to pagan temples and eat there at feasts that were dedicated to in the honor of idols. Now, that's not something that we deal with directly in our lives for the most part right? Uh, the, the, the closest comparison I can make to that is Chuck E. Cheese, all right? And uh, no, no person in their right mind would go there, but you do sometimes make the sacrifice for a child or a grandchild, right? And you, it, it, it smells, it's loud, and the pizza's terrible, and it costs a fortune. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you like Chuck E. Cheese, bless your heart, but 
Uh, anyway, the kids have fun. That's what's important. So I need to get back to my notes. All right. So anyway, so we, we're not familiar with being pressured to go to a banquet that's in favor of, say, the goddess Astareth or something like that. Um, so why would this be a strong temptation for Christians in Corinth 2,000 years ago? Well, here's why. Many of them were members of trade guilds in that city. And uh, the trade guilds usually required an allegiance. The, the, the trade guilds each had a patron god. And they required their members to pledge allegiance to those gods in various ways. And so if a Christian refused to attend the feast in dedication to that God, he might lose his job. More than that, he might be blackballed from his trade. Now imagine that. Imagine a man, let's just pick a blacksmith. Here's a blacksmith, and he's not been a Christian all his life. Uh, he came to Christ later in life, but uh, this, this man later in life becomes a Christian blacksmith, a believer in Christ, and when he refuses to attend a banquet held at the local temple for the idol, he is expelled from the blacksmith's guild in Corinth. Now he has lost his job, at least in Corinth. And not only that, but he's blackballed from ever working as a blacksmith again. In other words, the career he's worked so hard to achieve is now over, and he has to start from the bottom, from the beginning of some other type of work for which he is not trained, and he's probably going to not make as much uh, well of a living. All the years of his apprenticeship are wasted. All the investment that he has made monetarily in his shop have evaporated. That would be kind of like, in modern terms, kind of like going to medical school for eight years, earning a doctorate degree, and accruing massive student loans and debts and things like that, and then being told you cannot practice medicine. Uh, it, it, it would be a very difficult thing. And when we read about temptation for the Corinthian believers, it is no small thing. It is real. It is a big issue. These guys were under some serious pressure. There were, there were believers in Corinth who were not members of guilds. They weren't all members of guilds in that, in that uh, uh, city um, or in that church congregation. Some of them were slaves. Uh, some, some of them were maybe just freedmen but poor. Uh, but they, even these people faced temptation. First of all, when they went to purchase food, especially meat in the market, most of the meat that was sold in that market had been dedicated to idols in temple worship. Um, and so that, that meat um, was cheaper, and they could buy more expensive meat that was not dedicated to idols. So there was a, a problem, a conflict in the church over those issues. Secondly, if they, they might have been invited to a neighbor's house or a friend's house for dinner, and they sit down to eat, and the friend um, is not a believer, and they have a little shrine, maybe to Diana the goddess or something like that, over uh, on the wall, and they tell, they tell you before you go to eat, by the way, this meal is dedicated to the goddess Diana. What do you do at that point? Um, and so at that point, they're not losing a job or being thrown into prison, but they're facing, facing some social awkwardness and financial inconvenience in the market and in other people's homes. And so there the temptation to compromise is real. And it was at the time of these specific temptations that Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth and he said, God is faithful. Believe it, act like it. And he says the same to us today. We don't face the exact same temptations uh, that they did, but we, say, we face our own set of specific temptations. Many of them are serious business. And to us, the Bible says God is faithful. Believe it and act like it. Why is it so important for us to believe that and act like that? And that is because believing God's faithfulness opens to us the door of escape from temptation. 
Trusting God's faithfulness moves us away from the power of temptation. God in faithfulness provides an escape from temptation and believing his faithfulness avails us to that escape. It is like the door is locked and believing in God's faithfulness places the key into our hands and we can unlock the door and and walk out. And so how does this work? Well, to demonstrate how it works, we're going to evaluate together two groups of people Um, and Paul wrote and he said I uh, in verse 15 he said I speak as to wise men judge for yourselves what I say so we're going to take that advice and we're going to judge for ourselves we're going to evaluate two groups of people group number one uh, are those people who fail to believe in God's faithfulness group number two are those people who do believe in God's faithfulness And uh, so we're going to judge for ourselves. We're going to evaluate them. um, And we're going to see how believing God's faithfulness opens the door to escape from temptation. And that's what uh, this comparison is going to demonstrate. Let's look at this first group, all right? There are people who fail to believe in God's faithfulness, and they fall. All right, the people who fail to believe in God's faithfulness, they fall. Many people fail to believe God's faithfulness. As a result, they fail to escape temptation. They fall into sin over and over again, and their lives are dominated not by victory over sin, but by slavery to sin. Um, And we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, especially the first 11 verses, we see some examples, examples of people who fail to believe God's faithfulness and those are numerous in, uh, in, throughout history and in our lives, in our experiences. But the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 10 gives us a specific example. It's the children of Israel who saw God's mighty power. They all witnessed as God destroyed the mightiest empire in the world through his plagues. They all passed through the Red Sea. They saw the mightiest military power in the world pharaoh and all his chariots buried in the red sea that that mighty army delivered in front of a ragtag group of slaves who didn't even have swords or chariots or anything like that they were delivered from slavery in egypt and given the promise of god that they would dwell in the land of canaan what verdict does god pronounce on that generation that walked out of egypt In 1 Corinthians 10, 5, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Wow. Wow. Paul says that most of them did not please God. God was grieved by almost all of them because of their faithlessness. As proof of this assertion, Paul offers this evidence. He says, you want to know if God was pleased with them or not? Look at where they are. Their bodies are scattered throughout the wilderness. That's pretty good proof that God wasn't happy with them, right? Um, In fact, only two adults from that generation actually entered Canaan land. That was Joshua and Caleb. As for the rest, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation had died. Why does Paul mention these people? He tells us why, his purpose in in talking about them in verses 6 and 11. Verse 6, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. In verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so Paul's reason for citing them is that they are negative examples, examples of people who failed because they did not believe God's faithfulness and God's goodness. The negative examples are given for our admonition, for our instruction, so that we will know not to do what they did and to think how they thought and to want what they wanted. What did they do? Good question. Paul answers that in verse 7. 
And do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, what is... Paul talking about here? Well, he's telling us about what the children of Israel did when he brought them up out of Egypt. And Paul quickly mentioned several of the more prominent sins that plagued that nation as they, that they committed, uh, and, and then the judgment of God that followed up their sins. And Paul shows really just a pattern of sin dominating these people, Israel. And look at these examples. You have idolatry in verse 7. Israel, as, as soon as they get out of Egypt, they go to Mount Horeb. God, Moses is up in the mountain getting the law from God, and down below, they construct a golden calf and start worshiping it. They committed sexual immorality in several cases throughout the Old Testament. They did so in worshiping that golden calf. They did so with the women of Moab, and the, I'm sorry, the, the Midianite women. Um, and, uh, and then they put God to the test um, in verse 9, where they complained, is God among us or not? Will he provide food? Uh, and then they complained again in verse 10, uh, and that lines up with Exodus 16 and numerous other passages. The children of you, if you want to find someone that's hearts, whose heart's not right with God, find someone who just is always complaining, right? And um, we, can, uh, we can give the Israelites a hard time because uh, they were complainers, but our, sometimes we're really tempted with that too, aren't we? Uh, and so this is not an exhaustive list of Israel's sins. If you want that exhaustive list, uh, just read the, most of the Old Testament, all right? So we won't do that today for, for uh, lack of time. But uh, there's a purpose for these several things that are mentioned. It's not for us to go into the details of them, but it's for us to observe, really, from a bird's eye view, the lives of the children of Israel uh, and to see that pattern of sin. Um, and, and the idea is that when the pressures of life came upon them, they almost always turned to sin and not to God. And that is what happens in the life of any person who fails to believe in God's faithfulness. Their lives are characterized by a pattern of sin because when the heat of life is on them, when the pressures come on them, instead of turning to God to deal with that pressure, they turn to something else like alcohol or like pornography or, or like um, backbiting and gossip and things like that. And they turn to this sin or that sin uh, to help them relieve the pressure that they feel. And that pressure is real. Right? The children of Israel, you read about their lives. They had stuff to complain about. They weren't making it up. The problem is what they did with the pressures of their lives. It's the same for us. Different pressures for each of us individually. Um, but temptation, uh, victory over sin, is non-existent or rare for them. Temptation revealed their hearts. What they believed about God in their hearts came out in their actions and in their words. Uh, Dr. Kevin Carson uh, puts it this way. He says, the pressures that are common to humanity intersect with the heart and every person's heart, and those pressures expose it. Expose it. In other words, it reveals what's already there. I believe our text shows that the hearts exposed by pressures in life reveal a lack of trust in God's faithfulness. Why do people fail to believe God's faithfulness? Why is that? Some people, there's at least two reasons. We're going to explore two reasons. First of all, some people fail to believe in God's faithfulness simply because they cannot trust God's faithfulness. They don't have the ability, no ability to trust God's faithfulness. Now, some people cannot trust God's faithfulness. They don't have that ability because they're unsaved. In other words, uh, they are estranged from God by their sins. The Holy Spirit does not indwell them. They must be born again, for trusting God requires the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. They cannot trust God's faithfulness because they are unsaved. 
Others cannot trust God's faithfulness because they are unlearned. Unlearned. Uh, look what... Um, Look what Paul begins his chapter with. and He's writing to the people at Corinth. He says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. What is Paul saying here? I don't want you to be unaware of all that our fathers, that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and he goes on to explain some of the things we've talked about. What is Paul saying here? He says, he says I don't want you to be ignorant of these examples that we find in Scripture. He wrote to Gentile Christians in Corinth. They were not raised in a biblical culture, so some of them were maybe new Christians. Others of them may have been more familiar with these examples, um, but many of them uh, might have been ignorant with the Bible that they had at that point, which was mostly the Old Testament. And so they just did not know about the examples that Paul cited. Sadly, today many Christians do not have the foggiest idea of the examples that God gives to us in Scripture. And that is because they don't care. All right? Um, now, it is easier for some people to sit down and read than others. I, I do get that. I mean, I'm, I, I love to read. That's if, you, if, if, uh, if I'm daydreaming about my favorite pastime, I'm daydreaming about sitting down with a book and a good cup of coffee. Um, eight o'clock Colombian Peaks coffee, by the way, that's good. Friends don't let friends drink Folgers. Um, and, and I'm sitting down with that nice, mild, black cup of coffee, maybe on, in the afternoon, and, uh, and I'm reading a book or the Bible, something. That, to me, is having a great time. For some of you, that's just misery, all right? You don't want to sit down and read a book. You'd rather, you've got many other things that you're better at doing than I'm, I'm, I'm you know, some of you guys can, you can take a piece of wood, go into your garage and come out with a piece of furniture and it's beautiful and, it, and it's not crooked. Uh, and, and I envy you for that. And I can't, that, to me that's misery, all right? And, and to you reading, and so I understand that some people are just naturally wired in different ways uh, about, some of you are just, you're not going to sit down and you're just going to not going to read chapter after chapter of the Bible. And, and to you, I'm not trying to bust you over the head with this. Um, but God does speak to us through his word. And, and so maybe you won't become the world's foremost Bible scholar, but you should, you know, at least, at least read the Bible. I don't think any of you are illiterate. And if that is the case to the point where you just, you just can't read the Bible, there are audio Bibles and things like that. You can listen. Um, to it. You say, well, I won't understand all of it. Cool, neither do I. <laughs> all right? Um, and uh, that's okay, but you'll understand less of what you don't read. All right? And he's, here's Paul's point. I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant of what God has said. Um, some people um, some, some people uh, can't trust God's faithfulness because they don't know what God has said. And as a consequence, they, they cannot trust God's faithfulness. They might, you might even say, well, I believe God is faithful, and that's a true statement, and you believe it as far as you can, but faithful to what? To his word, to his people? How can you know that God is faithful to his word if you don't know his word, if you don't know what he said? So too many Christians these days are looking for signs all around them. There were people, not many people, but there were a few people that we're saying, hey, there's an eclipse coming and God's trying to get our attention through this eclipse and it makes this pattern across the United States. Of course, what they don't know is it makes that pattern every time. But um, anyway, and there was a couple things on Facebook and I didn't see much. I saw more backlash against it than I saw actual. But, but, but uh, anyway, some people are looking to the skies for signs and it's like, well, you got a whole book here. And it's more specific. Um, and so... Um, why do people fail to believe God's faithfulness? For one, they cannot trust it. They're unsaved. Others are unlearned, so they don't really just have the ability there. Um, now, there's people who cannot trust it. Here's a second reason people fail to trust God's faithfulness. Some people just will not trust God's faithfulness. It's not that they don't have the ability. They just don't have the desire to do that. Why? Well, for one thing, there are people who believe that they are exceptions to the rule. They believe there are exceptions. Other people might have to trust God's faithfulness, but not me. 
Um, look at verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Take heed means beware. All right? Uh, some people believe in their own faithfulness rather than in God's faithfulness. And so they are the one exception to every warning against temptation and sin. They are, they are legends in their own minds, too strong to fall into temptation. To these people, Paul says, if you, if you will not beware, you will fall into sin. Take heed lest you fall. In other words, you can't toy around with a little sin here, a little bit there. And you know your weaknesses. I don't need to, uh, I can't name them. I don't know your weaknesses. Uh, but the Holy Spirit can prompt you. You, you know what it is that you're tempted to say, ah, just a little bit here and a little bit there. And don't you know from experience, take heed lest you fall. And so there are people though that believe they're exceptions and they can toy around with it and they can do a little here and a little there. Um, and to those people, Paul says, beware lest you fall. They think they're an exception. There are other people who will not trust God's faithfulness because they believe in excuses. They believe in excuses. But look at verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. This is the promise of God's faithfulness here. He will not allow us to be tempted to the point that we must sin. All right, that's this promise. God will, he, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. That's what that means. So there never comes a point in your life where you just have to sin. And what does that promise imply? It implies that we never have an excuse to sin, at least not a, one that's legitimate. God gives us an escape, but he does not give us an excuse I don't know about you, but that makes me a little bit uncomfortable about some of my life choices, right? Uh, and, and there have been people, think about this, who have been put to death for their faith. You say, well, God didn't give them escape. They got put to death. That's the escape, all right? That's the escape. They refused to deny Christ they refused to fit sin in certain situations, and they were put to death. And through death, absent with the body, present with the Lord. At that moment, the moment of death, they did not regret. They did not regret taking that door of escape. What are some uh, uh, common excuses that people believe in that we even might offer? Well, we might offer the excuse of difficulty. I must sin because resisting this temptation is just too difficult. And usually we would say that about sins that we've really struggled with, and honestly, they are very difficult, right? And what's difficult for one person might not be as difficult for another, and vice versa. And some of the sins that I struggle with, you might look at and say, I can't believe that's a problem for you. Not a pr I don't even give it a second thought. And I might look at some of the sins you struggle with and judge you. Yeah, all right. What's wrong with you? I got that under control. In those cases, we should take heed lest we fall, right? But, but uh, difficulty, we believe in that as an excuse. We believe in, well, though we wouldn't use this, this very word, we might believe in the excuse we might call catharsis. Catharsis is a psychological term, and it refers to the process of releasing pressure and thereby, thereby causing relief from repressed emotions. Basically, the idea is, uh, imagine kind of like a, a water balloon is being filled up. You're like a water balloon just being filled up with water and the pressure increases until what happens? Boom, the water breaks, right? The, or the balloon breaks. And, uh, and so we don't want that. So if too much pressure builds up inside, the, we got to let a little water out. That's catharsis, all right? And, and um, in the same way, many Christians believe that you cannot defeat temptation. So when the pressure is building and building and building, if you don't just give in a little bit, the, then the dam is going to break and, and you're going to have great ruin. Um, and, and so we must release pressure through at least selective sins. Uh, for example, uh, people get, they, they might say, well, yes, I, I indulge in pornography, but that keeps me from cheating on my wife. Or, I have to get drunk on Friday nights to blow off steam. I've had a hard week. 
And if I don't do that, I just don't know how I can deal with life. There's people who believe that, right? Everybody's working for the weekend. That's what they say, right? I, I, I don't, you know, I, if I don't gossip at least a little, I would become an antisocial person. I wouldn't even know how to talk to people. And so I just have to, you know, I just have to do this. Just have to let out, out a little steam or I'll burst. And we usually don't say the word catharsis, but many Christians implicitly believe in it. Uh, we offer the excuse of circumstances. No, all, God, if you didn't want me to sin, then why did you allow this to happen? Um, and we kind of put that back on God, just like Adam said to, to God, it was the woman you gave me. If you hadn't given, what, what's the implication of that? If you hadn't given me a, this woman, uh, or, or not just any woman, but this one. If you give me a different one, that's what a lot of people think, right? Just give me a different one and everything's going to be all right. <laughs> It's not how it works. Um, circumstances. And some people, we offer the, ex the uh, excuse of brokenness. This is just how I am. Just got to take it or leave it. This is how I am. I struggle with this sin, therefore I will continue to indulge in it. Deal with it, people. Deal with it, God. And that is not a legitimate excuse. It, there's some truth to it. I mean, we're all wired differently. So some of us... Uh, struggle, like I said, we struggle in different areas, but, but that's, that's not an excuse. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. What happens to a person who does not escape temptation? Well, he falls, and, and, and we cannot stand on excuses, and we cannot be exceptions to the rule. And so believing God's faithfulness is essential because it opens to, to us the door of escape from temptation. We look away from ourselves and we'll look to God. And, and people who fail to believe in God's faithfulness, they fall. And they fail because they can't trust or because they won't trust God's faithfulness. And so uh, failing to escape from temptation's power, they fall and they fall hard into the grips of sin. And there they reap the dreaded consequences of their fall, as we have seen in our examples in Scripture here. Now let's look at what a, a what we should do about this, let's look at the positive side, the positive notion here. Let's turn our survey now to the second group. The first group um, did, did not believe in God's faithfulness and they fall. The second group of people, they do believe in God's faithfulness and guess what? They stand. They stand. Praise the Lord. There are people who have followed God's will, trusting that he is good and faithful. They express their belief in tangible ways, and the Lord made them able to stand in temptation. Um, and how do these people that stand, how do they express their belief in God's faithfulness? One way they do that, they express their belief through obedience. And here Paul gives us just a simple instruction. Therefore, my beloved flee from idolatry. Now remember who he's talking to. Remember their circumstance in life. And Paul's instruction for them is flee from idolatry. I don't think they had to do a deep dive into the scripture, deep study into the original languages or anything like that to figure out the meaning of what Paul was saying. This is pretty simple, isn't it? This is not, this is actually deep theology. Just because it's a, a short sentence doesn't mean it's not deep but it penetrates the bed bedrock core of what it means to be a Christian. This is practical, tangible action. Run away. This is a command, and it demands obedience. This command to flee from idolatry reminds me of a principle that the Lord Jesus taught. J. Adams likes to call this the doctrine of radical amputation. The idea is that if something in your life seems to cause you to stumble into sin or causes your faith to be weakened, then just take that thing out of your life, no matter how difficult it is to cut it off. Jesus said in Mark 9, 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands go to hell into fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now Jesus would press the point further, visualizing the same thing with your foot and with your eye. And in the immediate context, he is talking about specifically salvation. If anything in your life keeps you from faith in Christ, he says, get rid of it. Now, 
it is an illustration. Christ is not literally telling us to uh, cut parts off. You don't have to cut your hand off to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, all right? But the idea, the illustration, gets this point to us. If anything in life would keep you from faith in Christ, cut it off. Get rid of it. And Paul says to those who already have faith in Christ, if anything in your life uh, constantly causes you to stumble into sin, the sin of idolatry, um, if it brings temptation, flee from it. Get rid of it. Same idea. That's the doctrine of radical amputation. Run away to stand. Flee to victory. If something causes you to struggle with sin or temptation, get rid of it. For example, a television program. We've had to do that. Um, Just television program. Other people, I think, can watch that, but I can't. There there might be some of you that the, the television program, I I just had to turn it off because of some of the themes in it. It it wasn't what you'd call something terrible, but for me, I really liked it, but I had to, I'd say, nope, not that one. Um, Some people, uh, some people, well, you know, I can't have a smartphone. I have to have a dumb phone because the smartphone, I just can't handle that. Or a video game, hey, I can't stop playing this video game. It eats, you know, there are guys... 50-year-old guys who play video games all day long, all day long. They, they barely talk to their wives or their families or anything like that. That's not everybody that plays video games. I understand that. Uh, but, hey, there are some people that can play a video game and put it down. But, hey, you might have to cut that off. Um, there could be certain music or an un, even an ungodly friend that you have to separate yourself from at least in a cursory way. Um, and the Corinthians had a command to obey, flee from idolatry. For them, that meant stop going to idol temples to eat in those feasts, even if it costs you your job. Those who believe in God's faithfulness express that belief through their obedience. You would have to believe in God's faithfulness to do what they had to do. You would have to believe it. And you have to believe in God's faithfulness to take something that you love or something that you really like and just cut it out of your life. If you don't believe in God's faithfulness, you won't do that. You won't do it. Because that's the thing where you find comfort or joy or, or um, encouragement or, or um, uh, uh, entertainment. And uh, you, have, you really have to believe. Um, secondly, these people express their belief not just through obedience, but through dependence and look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13 again. No temptation is overtaking you except such as common to man. So you're not an exception. This is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape. Why? That you may be able to bear it. What, what will happen if they, dis- or if they obey the Lord? What will happen? What will the consequences be? How difficult will their life become? Well, for the Corinthian believers, we talked about this, difficult consequences. To obey the Lord and fleeing from idolatry could cost them a career. Uh, those, um, it could cost them more money when they go shopping. Um, is that a serious consequence? Yeah. How could they endure it? For believers all over the Roman Empire in the first century, in the second century, in the third century, the the command to flee from idolatry meant that they had to refuse to declare that Caesar is Lord. They would instead confess Jesus is Lord. If you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And because of this confession, Christians were called atheists, and many of them were put in prison, and many of them were killed in grotesque ways. Are those serious consequences? Yeah. How could they endure it? Instead of seeking satisfactory answers to those questions in human strength, people who believe in God's faithfulness believe he is able to empower them to bear all consequences to their confessions. Now, we face unique temptations. A man in his 50s will be affected by different temptations than a woman in her 70s. 
a 15-year-old boy will be tempta- tempted differently than a 30, 30-year-old women, woman, and so on and so forth. Um, an American faces different circumstances of temptation than, say, someone in Bolivia or Peru or Saudi Arabia. And, and you may face uh, the temptation of mild persecution. That is, your faith in Christ may, may cause you to lose friends or influence. And, and you're tempted to just blend in, just, just be one uh, with everybody else. Um, and, and, and your faith in Christ um, may be something that you hide under a bushel, right? Why does Jesus tell us that parable? Do not put your light on. You, you, you don't take, light a candle and put it under a bushel. You put it on a candlestick. Why does he tell us that? Because the common temptation is to put it under the bushel. Right? Because if you do that, nobody will mess with you. Some folks. So we face that temptation. Jesus dealt with harder temptation than we do, right? We, we face also the temptation, not just in that, but towards habitual sins like drunkenness and lust and pornography or gossip and slander or outbursts of angers. And these uh, these these sins look impossible to kill when you're caught up in them but even though the temptations of life might look different from person to person the path to victory is always the same the exit doors from this room of temptation this dark room they're all marked with that green exit sign and it's lit and you can see it and it's bright Believe that God is faithful and trust in that. George Young knew how to believe God's faithfulness. The hymn writer in 1903 expressed that knowledge in this familiar hymn. In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet. God leads his dear children along where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet. God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood. Some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow. But God, who is faithful, gives a song in the night season and all the day long. People who believe in God's faithfulness express their belief in two ways, in obedience and dependence. Believing God's faithfulness opens up that door of escape for us to walk away or even flee and run away from temptation. One evening years ago, A woman was driving home when she noticed a big truck behind her and it was driving uncomfortably close. So she stepped on the gas. She accelerated to gain some distance from the truck. Uh, But to her dismay, the truck also accelerated and stayed on her bumper. The faster she drove, the faster the truck drove. And now she was scared, so she exited the freeway. But the truck um, stayed with her. The woman uh, turned up a main street hoping to lose her pursuer in traffic. But the truck even ran a red light to continue the chase. Reaching the point of panic, this woman whooped, whipped her car into a well-lit service station and bolted out of her car, screaming for help. The truck driver sprang out of his truck and ran toward her car, and there he yanked the back door open and pulled out the man who was hiding in her back seat. You see, this woman had been running from the wrong person. From his high vantage point, the truck driver had spotted the would-be rapist hiding in the back seat of this woman's car. The chase was not an effort to harm her. The chase was an effort to save her. In the same way, many people run from God feeling or, or fearing what he might do to them. But his plans are for good and not for evil because God is faithful. And he rescues us from hidden sins that endanger our lives if we would just believe it. Do you believe in God's faithfulness? Your trust of God's faithfulness determines whether or not you will escape the powers of temptation. How do you express that trust? Through obedience and through dependence, through tangible actions. Believing God's faithfulness opens our escape from temptation.